Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be inviting our next uh, keynote speaker. He's a man that needs no introduction, and over the years has been known for being dynamic, diplomatic, and a true force in uniting and enhancing cooperation between OPEC and non-OPEC states. Since taking the post of Secretary General at OPEC in tw uh, 2016, his Excellency, Mr. Mohammed Senussi Barkindu, continues to be a leading voice in calling for the sustainable uh, stability of oil markets and the energy industry at large. So with no further ado, I would like to ask Mr. Barkindu to come to the stage. Good morning, dear friends and uh, colleagues. I was just uh, chatting with uh, Amina and other colleagues outside, uh, considering that this is the 40th anniversary of this very important uh, energy forum. I was just asking uh, how many of us in the room were here 40 years ago? And we started uh, counting. Uh, one name kept, uh, 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 you were sincerely was not born then. Uh, I think I, I joined Harman here when you invited us uh, in 1986, uh, was my baptisma here. And uh, I tried to keep faith with this very important forum. Now, I would say congratulations uh, to you and other colleagues and friends who kept faith uh, with this uh, conference. Now, returning to my second home, uh, London, in, in October, it can only be for one thing, and this is for this conference, for the Oil and Money uh, Conference. Uh, it has been uh, on my calendar ever since you first invited us in 1986. This year's event is definitely a milestone, uh, the 40th edition uh, of this leading energy industry conference. And uh, in OPEC, as you might know, next year we're going to hit our diamond anniversary, the 60th anniversary. Uh, just before the 41st uh, conference, maybe not oil and money, maybe energy conference. And uh, I really look forward to uh, this historic uh, regrouping in Baghdad, in Al Shab Hall, uh, in Babul Al Muaddam, uh, where the five founding members of our organization met. Uh, to establish OPEC. So we are working with you, moving step by step, shoulder to shoulder, as they say. Uh, you deserve the congratulations of the whole world uh, for keeping faith and making this a very, very successful international event. I would also like to ch thank uh, the chair of uh, the session, Amina, uh, a very good friend for her generous introduction as well as the organizers of Energy Intelligence for the invitation to speak. Over the four decades of this conference, the energy landscape has changed a great deal. But one thing that has remained constant, the ever-increasing need for stable and secure energy supplies as populations have expanded and economies have grown. This remains true as we look at decades to come. The global economy in 2040 is expected to double the size it was in 2018. And world population is projected to reach around 9.2 billion people, an increase of around 1.5 billion from today's level. 
we should also not forget that energy poverty remains a scorch of our time, even though positively the UN Secretary General's progress report on sustainable development goals recently noted that the total number of people with access to electricity fell below 1 billion people in 2017. And this is also in line with the projections and the data of the IEA. Uh, but there's still much work still uh, to be done. Uh, moreover, the 3 billion people who still lack access to low emission fuels for cooking are still there, uh, mainly in the developing countries of the South. In our world oil outlook, we see global energy demand increasing by around 33% by 2040. Energy will remain central to our daily lives, the lifeblood that enables us all to function and prosper. Today, however, as referenced by the theme of our conference this year, strategies for the energy transition, the energy industry finds itself at a crossroads. The world needs more energy, but this needs to be done in an ever more efficient and sustainable way, taking on board the challenges posed by climate change to our future. Standing here before you today, I think it's important to reiterate OPEC's position on climate change and the much talked about energy transition. We in OPEC, we fully support the science. We support the work of the IPCC. We participate in the meetings of the IPCC. We did not deny the existence of climate change. In OPEC, we have no climate deniers. OPEC takes climate change extremely seriously. As responsible citizens of the globe, we also believe there is no planet B. OPEC remains fully engaged and supportive of the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement, which remain the only viable global frameworks for, to address climate change. All 14 member countries, including Ecuador, have signed the Paris Agreement. And 10 out of these 14 have ratified the agreement. We have been co-authors of the United Nations Framework Convention of Climate Change. We have also been co-authors of its sister protocol, the Kyoto Protocol. We have also been co-authors of the Paris Agreement. And we are now fully engaged in the Talanoa Dialogue, which, inshallah, will meet in Santiago, Chile at COP25 to begin to operationalize the Paris Agreement. We see it as a positive development that climate change issues have garnered increased public attention and enthusiasm, especially among our children, among the youths. It is our deeply held conviction that dialogue on this matter should be inclusive and broad to try and evolve this energy transition in the least disruptive manner. We need to think carefully about what an energy transition actually means. And we all need to follow the right paths to lead us to a sustainable energy future. We need to all work together step by step, shoulder to shoulder, find issues of commonality, and appreciate what is at stake. We need to transition to a more inclusive world in which every person has access to energy, a world where no one is left behind, including the nearly three billion who have no access to clean cooking fuels, including the nearly one billion who have no access to electricity that we take for granted. As Ben Van Baden of Shell said 
at this conference, I believe yesterday, Ben said the world needs oil and gas because it is what the world relies on for such, for so much, including often its most basic needs of heat and food and shelter. And that will not change overnight. This is why Shell will continue to invest in oil and gas, even as we work to help speed progress to a lower carbon future. That was Ben yesterday. There are clearly some who believe the oil and gas industry should not be part of our energy future, that we should be consigned to the past, that the future is one that can be dominated by other sources of energy, in particular renewables and electric vehicles. Now that's their view. They are entitled to their opinion. It is important to state clearly, however, that the science does not tell us this. It tells us that we need to reduce emissions and use energy more efficiently. The stark statistics related to the blight of energy poverty do not tell us this either. Renewables are definitely coming of age, with wind and solar expanding fast, but even by 2040, in our oil outlook, they are only estimated to make up around 19% of the global energy mix. With nuclear expected to be at just over 6% and coal at just over 21% by 2040, it means that oil and gas combined are focused to still supply over 50% of the world's energy needs by 2040, with oil at around 28% and gas at about 25%. We appreciate that some will view this as an OPEC focused, maybe dispute the numbers and state that the organization is against renewables. Firstly, let me say that many of our member countries have great sources of solar and wind and are seeing huge investments being made in this field. And secondly, we do not see any reputable outlook projecting that renewables will come anywhere close to overtaking oil and gas in the decades ahead. We welcome the development of renewables. From the perspective of electric vehicles, there is also no doubt that they will continue to see expansion in the transportation sector. We see this in our outlook with the share of EVs in the total road transportation fleet projected to expand to around 13% in 2040. Again, we support their development in a sustainable manner. However, for many of the world's population, it is clear that no matter which way you look at it, electric vehicles, do not offer a viable alternative to the internal combustion engine. Moreover, there is also a debate about how environmentally friendly they are, considering the build process for them, especially the batteries, as well as where the electricity is sourced from. Here I think it is also relevant to highlight one of the key details of our outlook. In the period to 2040, fuel efficiency improvements are expected to result in a far greater reduction in oil demand than the increasing penetration of alternative fuel vehicles. To put it simply, the basic challenge of the energy transition we face today can be summed up in two questions. How can we ensure there is enough supply to meet expected future demand growth? And how can this growth be achieved in a sustainable way? Balancing the needs of people in relation to their social welfare, the economy, and the environment. It all points to not limiting ourselves by putting all our eggs in one basket. We need to look for cleaner and more efficient technological solutions everywhere <coughs> across all available energies. And as our friend Bob Dudley said also, I believe was yesterday, when tackling emissions, there needs to be recognition 
that there are many paths and we need to pursue them all. At OPEC, we recognize the complexity of this challenge. Complex problems require comprehensive solutions. The oil industry has to be part of the solution. It possesses critical resources and expertise that can help unlock our carbon-free future. For oil and gas, the environmental challenge is not oil and gas themselves. It is the emissions that come from burning them. We are believers that solutions can be found in technologies such as the carbon capture and sequestration technologies and others that reduce and ultimately eliminate these emissions. We will need a very broad portfolio of emission removal technologies to tackle climate change. We welcome coordinated action within the industry and through various research and development platforms, such as the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. Given what I have just described, we also need to appreciate that policies and lobbying focused on shifting investors away from oil and gas are not the way forward. Firstly, as Bill Gates said recently in the Financial Times, and I quote, divestment to date probably has reduced about zero tons of emissions. And secondly, references to stranded assets and declining values in our industry advances a potentially dangerous scenario where the necessary investments may not be made, one that could increase volatility significantly and lead to a future energy shortfall. Moreover, if those billions of people in the developing world that suffer from a lack of energy access feel they are being sidelined from energies that have helped fuel the developed world, then this could sow further divisions and expand the divide between the halves and the half-nots, between the north and the south. I'm sure I speak for everyone in this room when I say how important funding and investment is in any talk of an energy transition and diversification. This was a point also referenced unequivocally by Patrick Puyen of Total on Tuesday at this conference. It is vital, vital we have a stable environment and a level playing field where the focus is not on the energy source but on reducing emissions. From OPEC's perspective, let me stress once again that we fully identify with the fact that the foundation for investment, growth, and economic diversification can only come through balance and stability in the market. OPEC member countries remain fully committed to investments across the world, the whole industry value chain, and the issue of returning global investments is a core focus of our historic declaration of cooperation between OPEC and non-OPEC producing countries, and recently endorsed in the Charter of Cooperation. Dear friends and colleagues, wherever I go, I'm often asked, what's the best way forward? And when you look at the plethora of opinions and divergent viewpoints about the future energy transition, well, I cannot say I have the answers. I believe no one does. And if anyone says they do, then I might have to politely say they, not, may, they may not be telling the whole truth. What I can say is that OPEC, and I'm sure the entire oil and gas industry welcomes dialogue with all stakeholders and welcome actions too. It was the British philosopher Bertrand Russell, who once said, and I quote, the only thing that will redeem mankind is cooperation. We can no longer walk in silos, my dear friends. We can no longer see our futures in polarized terms. We need to ensure sustainable growth, development, and prosperity for ourselves, for our children, for our children's children. And we need to stress that the scale of the climate challenge means that no single energy source 
is a panacea. Nor can the contribution of an entire industry or group of countries be overlooked. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much for that speech. Um, Mr. Burkindu, I'll just get into the incident that is on everybody's mind and has been a topic of conversation ever since it happened, the Saudi attacks on the Khores and Upkeik facilities that took out 50% of the kingdom's capacity. I um, want to know from you what was OPEC's reaction to the attacks and uh, how important is the issue of maintaining and increasing spare capacity and perhaps reopening production from areas such as the neutral zone, which is shared between Kuwait and Saudi Arabia? Uh, thank you uh, very much, Amina. I think a lot has been said by the kingdom itself on this very unfortunate incident. And I believe uh, my friend Amin Nasser was here yesterday or a couple of days ago uh, and dwelt a lot uh, probably uh, with colleagues on what transpired and how they, in my opinion, in very heroic uh, ways uh, rose to the challenge uh, to avert what could have been a major, major global energy crisis. Who would have thought that uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the biggest producer of oil in the world, in a matter of minutes losing 50% of uh, their production. And yet, in less than two weeks, their crisis management teams in Aramco, in the ministry and so on, uh, could get their act together and not only contain the situation, but uh, restore uh, their production. So as I've said, in several fora, uh, when you and I were in Baghdad on the 14th of September and uh, got this breaking news, uh, you could see the pandemonium uh, among people uh, because of the uncertainties. Uh, now, this has taught us a lot of lessons that we urgently need to focus on, and there's no better place than oil and money. Uh, one, the security of energy infrastructure, be they in the kingdom or anywhere, I think now should be elevated uh, to high levels. The oil and gas we produce in our countries do not belong to us. In sovereign terms, yes, the lawyers will tell you, yeah, this production belongs to Kuwait, belongs to uh, Iraq or Iran but we produce for the global markets. Uh, we owe it to consumers uh, in this world to remain reliable and dependable suppliers of oil and gas. And therefore, the protection of these facilities is to protect security of supply uh, globally. Uh, as I've said in, in, in Baghdad, uh, we had to remain calm. We don't normally uh, press panic buttons in OPEC. Uh, uh, we have gone through a lot in the last 59 years. Uh, our members went to war, unfortunately. We have seen uh, through about six oil cycles. Uh, but we had to remain calm and collected and reach out. Uh, one of the first phone calls I placed in Baghdad was uh, to Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman, uh, the newly appointed uh, Minister of Energy, who happened to be in London that fat fateful morning. And then secondly, to my colleague in Paris, uh, Fathi Birola, the IEA, on what should we do. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, they were both very calm and collected very rational in their response, uh, focusing on containing the situation uh, and begin immediately uh, to uh, implement their recovery measures. Uh, and I think I, 
I told Daniel Yergin uh, in, 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 in Moscow that if and when he decides to update his uh, book, The Price, I think the incident in Abkhaz and, and Kureis in Saudi Arabia uh, will feature prominently, especially uh, the, the, the amount of work that went within those few days. Uh, these guys walking 24 seven round the clock. Uh, to date, I have not had a single force major, uh, despite that huge volume of 5.7 million barrels a day being lost to the market. Now, Mr. Barkindu, um, the attack was a shock to, to everyone, but also the reaction of the price was a shock. Um, the price went up $10 and then dropped. And we've been speaking here for the past couple of days about the reasons behind that, but I want to focus on demand. Where do you see demand going, and is this a concern for you? And going into December, do you think OPEC Plus needs to cut its production further to balance the market? Yes, I think with the benefit of hindsight, the fact that this uh, sad event took place on a weekend when markets were closed, I think also was helpful. Uh, and within that period before the markets opened on Monday, uh, the very responsible, uh, proactive statements from the kingdom, from the IEA, from ourselves in OPEC, I think helped to uh, calm nerves. But of course on Monday we saw uh, prices uh, rose by nearly 20%. Uh, uh, and I think that's the highest in nearly 40 years that we have seen. Uh, but this should be expected. Uh, I have spoken to some colleagues here in London who said they expected even a very high spike. Uh, they were surprised that it stayed at 20 and immediately uh, came down. Now, demand is of concern uh, to all of us. Uh, we continue to see the global economy uh, 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 overshadowing uh, demand. Uh, we continue to see the trade discussions uh, between the United States and China uh, continuing to cast a long shadow going forward. Uh, we continue to see uh, uh, situations in Europe that point to, at best, uh, flattening of the curve. Uh, the outcome of Brexit is still unknown. I'm still trying to fight out more from London as since I'm in London, and how that will impact on growth in the EU and also uh, 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 demand generally. We are also following the transition in Germany and the near technical recession of contraction of manufacturing in Germany. Uh, the US still remains a very bright spot uh, uh, growth is continuing. Uh, the labor numbers are very robust. Uh, uh, the Fed seems to remain ahead of the, of the curve. Uh, so all in all, uh, we remain optimistic that the U.S. and China will reach some understanding. Uh, the cost of not doing that to both of them I think uh, would be catastrophic. Uh, and both are very much aware of the consequences. Therefore, uh, the demand revisions that we are beginning to see from reputable institutions such as you, yourself uh, may have to be in measured terms uh, going forward. Mr. Burkindo, you were recently in Russia and you met with the Russian President uh, Putin. Can you tell us uh, how committed is the Russian President to the current OPEC Plus agreement? And can you explain to us what is the long-term cooperation charter uh, and how does that differentiate from the charter that you signed recently? The Russian Federation uh, remains committed to the cooperation uh, the supply adjustments 
in the declaration of cooperation. Uh, they remain uh, the pillar, the bridge uh, that binds the OPEC and the non-OPEC countries together in this declaration. And uh, President Putin uh, remains focused uh, on how to enhance this cooperation with OPEC. So his commitment is not only to the supply adjustments, but he is also focused on how we should institutionalize this cooperation uh, going forward, and hence uh, the support for the Charter of Cooperation. Now, it's important to distinguish the two. The Declaration of Cooperation brought together these 24 countries to address the supply imbalance that led to this cycle, this last cycle, which saw stocks skyrocketing to unprecedented levels, over 400 million barrels, uh, which has never been recorded. So the Declaration of Cooperation focused on how to restore that balance between supply and demand by addressing the variable of stocks. But the Charter of Cooperation that we signed on the 2nd of July, uh, it's a more open, broader platform of all oil producers, not exporters now, but producers. And there are about 97 producing countries according to our database, meaning all these countries are free to join this platform to discuss about the future of this energy source. This energy source that is responsible for the growth, the development, the prosperity of this civilization. This is an oil civilization. Now, going forward in this transition, with all what we are seeing, what we are reading, what we are hearing, we thought that we needed such a platform to bring producers to come and discuss these issues, among, among many others. I have one final question before we open the question to the floor. Um, are current price levels sufficient to maintain investment in uh, the oil uh, sector? We have seen this sharp contraction, uh, 2015, 2016, two consecutive years, cumulatively over 50% contraction in investment. And according to the records, that was also unprecedented. And considering that this industry of ours is so capital intensive, and you have two years consecutively of this sharp contraction, in 2017, 2018, we have only started seeing ticking up of investments. Now, there are a variety of factors responsible for that. I don't think time will allow us to go into that. But the issue of investments also, like the issue of security, needs to be elevated on our agenda. Uh, the future of the industry depends on sustained investments. Uh, I met many bankers yesterday here, and uh, several of them told me the growing encumbrances in the banking community that is facing us, uh, clear obstacles to accessing the same pool of funds that all other sectors, whether telecommunications, infrastructure, is the same pool of funds. But we are being singled out with, with, with these encumbrances. So already we are facing this shortage, this deficit. And now going forward, we are faced with these obstacles in the name of uh, environmental encumbrances. So the industry needs to rise with one voice, uh, such as here at Oil and Money, to really discuss, to brainstorm, to dwell on what is the way forward. We think it's totally unfair on this industry, and it's totally unfair on the billions of people in this world that look up to us to continue 
to provide them with energy for their day-to-day -day lives. Food, shelter, transport, whatever you can think of, it's on us. And yet, we are continuously being put on the defensive to the extent that uh, some conferences are even changing their titles to be which one to be politic <laughs> to be politically correct. So uh, we are concerned. We are really concerned. Uh, we think we believe that the over one trillion barrels of proven reserves underground are there not only to meet current demand but to meet future demand of billions of people in this world. Uh, as I've said in my statements and many interviews, that we have no concept of stranded assets. And the science is very clear. You read the IPCC reports. Uh, we read your reports in the AIG. Uh, all these sources are required. Uh, some of the targets and the projections we are seeing from the other side are just unworkable, uh, totally unrealistic. Uh, but I'm glad that uh, uh, oil and money is continuing to uh, bring together uh, uh, the best hands and brains in the industry uh, to focus on our common, common challenges. This is the only way we can come up with these common solutions. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. I've been asked to wrap up. Uh, Mr. Barkindo, on that note, I thank you very much for joining us today and uh, look forward to joining us next year. Thank you.